Live from Case at 12. The six o'clock news starts right now. An east side nursing home designated to house COVID-19 positive patients now at the center of a growing number of complaints about the care being provided there. One family says their 96 year old grandfather died this week after an elevated room temperature caused him to become severely dehydrated. It makes it 10 times worse knowing that, you know, my grandpa served for his country and for people to sit there and neglect, neglect him, him and just not even care about him at all. That grandfather, one of five people at the facility to die since the pandemic began. In this Defenders report, Dylan Collier takes a closer look at the emerging criticisms. He was walking, talking, eating drinking and William M. Doria's family says as recently as last week, the family patriarch was healthy, a mild case of COVID-19 that had hospitalized him last month, forced Doria to be moved to River City Care Center, while his caretaker, his son, recovered from the same virus. Monday, the family learned Doria had been taken from the long-term care facility by ambulance after they said cooling issues inside the building this past weekend caused a fever, decreased blood pressure, breathing problems, and he was severely, severely dehydrated. Doria, a World War II veteran who had decades of stories to tell, died earlier this week after a brief stay in hospice. I would do anything for that man and just to hear him talk, to talk one more time. I'm sorry. State officials confirmed this afternoon they are actively investigating the facility, but said they had no information to share on whether River City's air conditioning units are working properly. Last July, a complaint inspection done by the state revealed rooms with temperatures as high as 82.9 degrees, a room temperature described as hot, and one resident lying in bed wearing only shorts with a fan blowing directly on his face. We got notified that uh, the air condition would have went down. Esteban Aguirre's mother, Amelia, was housed at River City after surviving a COVID outbreak at another San Antonio nursing home, the Rio at Mission Trails, in early May. Her family claims she tested negative for the virus twice in four days last month and should have been returned to the Rio, but instead had to endure the extreme heat because of a clerical error. Somebody in there had misspelled or put the incorrect name on, on, them, on, on, on my mom's information. For the Defenders, Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. A Dallas-based spokeswoman for River Center, River City rather, sent us a response saying they reported to the city of San Antonio that the AC unit that services a common area was serviced over the weekend. And quote, none of the units which service residential rooms was out of operation during this time. However, staff purchased small air conditioning units and fans to cool areas which were warmer than usual due to outside temperatures, end quote. It has everyone talking today. Fiesta 2020 is officially canceled. That announcement coming earlier today from the Fiesta San Antonio Commission. Mayor Ron Nirenberg saying the decision was difficult but necessary since it doesn't look like the COVID-19 pandemic is slowing down anytime soon. Devin Clark live outside of the Fiesta Commission offices just north of downtown with all the details. Devin. Well, Myra, as we know, this announcement comes after Fiesta had already been postponed until November. But with coronavirus cases continuing to surge here in Texas, officials say it's just not safe enough to have Fiesta at all this year. But at the end of the day, it came down to the health and safety uh, of our community, uh, our Fiesta guests, our vendors, our nonprofits. And we wanted to make sure they were safe. This is a deadly virus, uh, and we were concerned about that. And that was Fiesta San Antonio Commission President Baltazar Walter Cerna Jr., who today released a statement which in part reads, quote, the health and safety of Fiesta guests and volunteers is the only priority in this decision, end quote. We know that hundreds of thousands of people are drawn to downtown San Antonio yearly for the two-week event, including the thousands of volunteers. So the idea of keeping everyone safe took precedence. The new scheduled dates for Fiesta are April 15th through the 25th, 2021. And if all goes as planned, it will be the 130th anniversary of Fiesta. Today, some would-be festival goers struggled with the notion of postponing Fiesta again. And I know that there's some dangers involved, but it's such a big tradition. I'd hate for anybody to get sick. It'd be really sad if people got sick because of it, but it's a great tradition. 
And you can read the full statement from the Fiesta San Antonio Commission right now online at KSAT.com. And later on in this newscast, you can hear from Mayor Ron Nirenberg, who will be answering questions about Fiesta and this year's cancellation. For now, reporting live outside of the Fiesta Commission, just north of downtown, Devin Clark, KSAT 12 News. It will be missed this year. Thanks, Devin. The Dominguez State Jail just outside San Antonio has recorded its first COVID-19 related death. A death the 51 year old inmates father blames on inhumane living conditions and mismanaged offender care at the prison. He told our Paul Venema that without any changes, he believes more deaths are sure to follow. Horrible impact, Paul, a horrible impact. It's been very sorrowful for us. This man, we'll call him Alex, since he asked that we not use his name, is talking about the impact of the death of his 51-year-old son on his family. On June 23rd, his son was transferred from the Dominguez State Jail to a Galveston hospital after he was diagnosed with COVID-19. He told the nurse uh, that he would like to speak to his mother. And unfortunately, that was denied. He died four days later. Doctors said COVID-19 was a contributing factor. So were conditions at the prison, according to Alex. They put all the offenders into one room. So if anyone, no mask, no protection, no nothing. So if one had the virus, he would spread it to the others that were there. There are currently about 500 positive cases reported at the Dominguez prison. Alex said more deaths there are inevitable. In a statement released this week, TDCJ said that they've begun more testing. The testing allows the agency to separate and contain the virus within the facility. Positive offenders are monitored closely by medical staff. The agency is also deploying additional disinfecting equipment throughout the state. That's little consolation for Alex and his family, he said, their only consolation. He was a, a true Christian with all this, with a full sense of the word. Paul Venema, case at 12 News. It's a primary source of revenue hit hard by the dramatic drop in tourism. The city's Department of Arts and Culture looked beyond the hotel motel tax. It actually found $2.6 million in COVID-19 relief funds for artists and nonprofit arts organizations. Jesse Degriato tells us why it's believed they are struggling like small businesses and they also need a helping hand. Almost everywhere you look in San Antonio, it's estimated the arts have been contributing close to $5 billion yearly to the city's economy. It is a lot. The arts has a lot of impact economically and culturally in San Antonio. We wouldn't be who we are without arts and culture. Yet she says they've been decimated by the pandemic. You can't have a performance. You can't have people coming to your events. You can't be open. And no new productions that would need original music that can take months to compose. So you invest the amount of time that um, you are not getting paid for. And no 39th annual Tejano Conjunto Festival or other events staged by the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. We had to completely stop doing what it is that we do. But the Guadalupe could still find ways to connect with the community if it gets a grant through the city's Cares for Art program. That'll help us keep some of our artists and our employees um, employed for the remainder of the fiscal year. And a composer creating music that's good for the soul. Your soul needs to be at least uh, a little bit comforted when uh, these uh, hard times uh, come. Sometimes arts is the only respite that people get. The arts uh, create an environment for humanity that makes life worth living. Jesse De Goyado, KSAT 12 News. A little under two hours left to vote early for the July primary election. Today is the last day of early voting. Polls close at 8 o'clock tonight. More than 42,000 votes have already been cast early. In Bear County, this runoff election includes six races for the Republican primary and 12 races for the Democratic primary. Election day for the runoff is July 14th. Look outside with live cam 102. Two. Yay. Oh. Oy. Oh, but that was not <laughs> that was not our high for the day.
Okay. It was that's warmer? Worse. I think yeah. that's worse. It was warmer than that. I'm going to make you wait for it. Okay. Though. All right. True tease. True tease. Yeah, and it's going to continue to get hotter over the next few days. We'll see more records fall through early next week. Also falling, the aquifer down 7 tenths of a foot today to 657.4. And it unfortunately has been on a fairly steady decline since the beginning of June. And of course, stage one water restrictions went into effect today for SAWS customers. More information about this, you can save this image to, to your mobile phone or to your computer. Just head to ksat.com to check that out. No rain in the forecast this weekend, but more record-breaking heat. And we'll talk all about your full forecasts coming up in just a bit. Of course, the big news of the day is the fact that Fiesta 2020 has been canceled. We expect that the mayor and the county judge will talk about that during the upcoming briefing that we're just a few minutes away. But there's a lot more, too, uh, that they're probably going to touch on today. Absolutely. Yesterday, we saw nearly a thousand new cases reported throughout the week. Some of the biggest eye opening news out of these daily briefings, the ages of some of the people who have passed away, people in their 20s and 30s, the youngest that we have seen so far. Yeah which was startling. You could Absolutely. tell even even the uh, county judge and the mayor were surprised at what was happening. All right, we're just a few seconds away from the county brief county city briefing. Let's go live now to City Hall. I'm mayor Ron Nuremberg, along with Commissioner Justin Rodriguez from Bear County, as well as Dr. Lynette Watkins, who is the chief medical officer of Baptist Health System and Mario Martinez from our San Antonio Metro Health. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight, we have 923 new cases of COVID-19 to report, which brings our total to 18,602 cases. 75% of the cases are Hispanic residents, 16% white, and 6% black. Young adults between the ages of 20 and 29 remain the largest percentage of those infected. Nearly one in four COVID positive patients are in this age group. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, testing. San Antonio is one of only three jurisdictions in the state that have followed the state health guidance to count antigen tests in our case count. Count. The other jurisdictions that don't count these tests also don't do the investigations, the case investigations or contact tracing for them. The result is that San Antonio is reporting sometimes a higher case count than other cities, and we also have a greater number of cases to investigate. From a science perspective and a medical perspective, it, it doesn't make any sense to count these test results as to not count these test results as they are just as accurate in determining positive cases. This gives us a better sense of where the infections are so we can control it in our community and get back to some sense of normalcy. Beginning Monday, we will break down these positive case uh, test results for a more apples to apples comparison if you'd like to make that with other cities. Again, our positive uh, PCR tests as well as our positive antigen tests. And Mario is here and he can speak a little bit more about the science behind those two tests. We do have one new death to report tonight. Uh, a young man, unfortunately, and his, he was Hispanic in his late teens with um, conditions he was being treated for at University Hospital. We now lost 166 San Antonians to COVID-19, and our hearts are with their friends and families. Um, people of all ages, uh, people, again, with a lot of life to live, and so we want to all uh, recognize the seriousness of this pandemic. Our hospital systems remain under high stress, and unfortunately, they are nearing severe stress with 1,240 people in the hospital tonight, up 24 from yesterday. We now have 10% of staffed hospital beds available for new patients. Uh, 416 folks are in the ICU tonight and 248 are on ventilators. Both of those numbers are up 17 from yesterday. I want to make a special mention about plasma. Our hospital has seen a huge increase in the need for convalescent plasma to treat patients fighting COVID-19. At the start of June, uh, which was just about four weeks ago, hospitals ordered about five units of plasma per day. They're now ordering more than 100 units a day of convalescent plasma. We know there are thousands of San Antonians now who have recovered from COVID-19 and could be potential donors for convalescent plasma, and that plasma is being used very successfully to save lives. So our goal as a community is to get San Antonio screened, screen as many potential uh, donors, recovered patients as possible, to see if they have the antibodies to meet the health requirements to become a qualified donor. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is planning a major screening event very soon, and we'll have more details.
details on that in the coming days. In the meantime, uh, if you are recovered and you know someone who has, you can go to SouthTexasBlood.org for more information about becoming a plasma donor. I'm going to turn it over now to Commissioner Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor. And, and again, I think just a sobering reminder when you hear about um, losing someone from our community um, in their teens that this, uh, this disease does not um, discriminate, and we certainly send our prayers and, and wishes to his family um, as well. Uh, but just looking back at, at the week, Mayor, uh, you know, we've had, we wish we had better news, obviously. We've had, uh, I think, Monday, 351 positive cases, 778 Tuesday, 845 Wednesday, 954 Thursday, and again, 923 today. So almost 4,000 positive uh, cases just this week. Um, again, I, I think we can't emphasize enough, particularly going into the week uh, that folks continue to stick with the program and, and the social distancing, no large gatherings, wash your hands, and of course your face covering. Um, I know it sounds like a broken record, but we know that it works, um, and hopefully uh, we'll see these numbers start to, to dip in the coming uh, days and weeks ahead. Uh, a couple quick things I wanted to mention. One is to piggyback on what you mentioned, Mayor, um, the, the uh, plasma donations. Um, we know that there's about 6,100 folks who have recovered from COVID in our community. Um, of those, only about 150 have uh, given plasma. So there's, uh, that's about 2% of, of the total population of the recoveries. So we want to make sure and get that message out. Again, go to SouthTexasBlood.org uh, if you're one that's recovered and, and donate plasma if you uh, uh, could. That would be uh, much appreciated by our community and by those who are trying to recover themselves. I'll also mention, and I've signed up uh, for next week, um, if you give blood, um, I'm signed up on Wednesday next week. Now through August 31st, the Blood and Tissue Center will actually test for free um, whether or not you have the, the uh, antibodies for COVID. So, um, again, go to SouthTexasBlood.org for that information and to register. Uh, lastly, let me mention, too, we still have plenty of folks in our community who are in need. We had a um, call for help this earlier this week from the, the uh, food bank. Plenty of volunteers still needed. They're hundreds uh, short. Uh, so if you can uh, donate some of your time, go to safoodbank.org to help out at our area food bank. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, again, we are all in this together. Everyone has a role to play, whether it's simple mask wearing and physical distancing, or if you can become a, a donor, we need you as well. Uh, Dr. Watkins is here who can talk a little bit about uh, some of the surge management and the new nurses and, and things we are getting from the state and federal level. Uh, Mario is here also who can speak a little bit more about the testing if there are any questions. But at this point, we'll go to questions. Um. Mr. Martinez, can you talk about the um, the difference between um, the antigen test and the positive test? Yeah. So the uh, molecular test, um, so that's like the PCR test. It detects the um, you know the virus in the individual. Uh, so this is what we uh, commonly known as the the no swab. And so um, it's it's a very sensitive test. And so when you compare that to, for example, an antigen test, um, an antigen test is uh, testing for the, the protein. Uh, and so it's still considered um, an accurate positive, and experts actually um, prefer that an antigen test be used when you're testing large populations. And so now in San Antonio, as we have more widespread uh, prevalence of uh, COVID-19, uh, it is you know, definitely a, a good test to use in our community. Why is it better to test in a large population? Does the test come back faster or is it cheaper? So it is, um, it is the test that you, can you heard the assistant director of Metro Health there explaining the difference in testing that the mayor referred to as right. to why the San Antonio area may be having a higher case count than some of the larger metro areas in Texas. They're going to go into that further in detail on Monday. But as for today, what we know, there are now 10% of local staffed hospital beds available. That number is down from yesterday. 923 new cases of COVID-19 and the one death they reported today, a teenager, a male teenager who the mayor said was fighting other conditions at University Hospital. 75% of the new cases are from our Hispanic population. And you also heard a call for convalescent 
plasma donations. That is something that is we, they've been calling on, but we didn't have an idea of how many people that have recovered from COVID-19 have actually given. Uh, County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez said right now only about 2% of all the people who have recovered have donated their convalescent plasma to help others recover, which is a proven a way to recover from some of this. So they are definitely calling on the 98% of you out there who have recovered from COVID-19, who have the antibodies to give convalescent plasma at the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. And at last check, that was more than 6,000 San Antonians who have that convalescent plasma. Do want to also mention that um, if you'd like to sign up to donate, donate blood as well, southtexasblood.org. They also uh, call for volunteers there. And something else that I find really interesting, still the largest percentage of people infected, people ages 20 to 29 in San Antonio. One in four positive cases are among that age group still. Absolutely. All right, let's switch quickly to weather because I know we had we went above and beyond the forecast today. Yes, which I'm not all that thrilled about. No, 103 today and the heat is going to continue to build this weekend into early next week. It does look like our temperatures will peak Monday with a forecast high of 106. In light of that, CPS Energy is anticipating Monday the 13th being an energy demand day or a KSAT power saver day as everyone gets back to work Monday. So you're encouraged to lower your energy use peak heating hours there 3 to 7 p.m. on Monday. We'll talk more about a very hot forecast and even get a check of the tropics coming up next half hour. That'll be along in just a bit. Spurs are in Orlando getting ready to resume the NBA season and play the sport they love so much. Life in the NBA's bubble won't be easy, but for some, it's probably better than not playing ball at all. DeMar DeRozan stayed in shape the best he could during the shutdown, and he's eager to play five-on-five -five basketball. For me, through this whole quarantine, you know, I haven't stopped working out. I, you know, I've been on top of, you know, every single thing, um, body-wise. Being able to have a, you know access to a gym in my house, being able to play basketball, so it's it's been nonstop for me. But you know the joy to not be able to play five on five for the last three 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 months will take a toll on anybody because my whole life I've been playing basketball every single day since I was seven eight years old. And Lonnie Walker the fourth misses his puppies, tweeting today of only the bubble allowed dogs. In recent weeks, when high schools shut summer strength and conditioning down due to COVID-19 cases rising, many area student athletes didn't miss a beat thanks to BSA Sports Lab and shirts. BSA stands for Balance, Strength, and Athleticism, and you can find plenty of big dogs there working out like new Judson running back LJ Butler. Back in June, his mother sent us an email saying he will not be returning to Wagner for a senior season and that he's transferring to Judson. Earlier this week, we stopped by BSA Lab, where Butler said leaving his Wagner teammates wasn't easy. It was very hard because them I grew up with them since middle school. I've been playing with the same boys, and like before middle school with Typha League, I've been playing with them boys. But they all told me that um, they were going for me, and that was a good move for myself, and uh, they supported me 100%. We will have much more on the BSA Lab Sunday night at Instant Replay. It's a great place for athletes to train. San Antonio FC is hard at work getting ready to resume USL championship season play. The training moratorium was lifted a little more than two weeks ago, paving the way for full team training. That means SAFC will have three weeks and some change to prep for RGV FC. It's, it's a lot of challenge because obviously, um, you know, you have to get your fitness in, you have to get all the stuff in. But I think as a team, uh, the coaches and the staff have done a fantastic job of making sure that when we had a time away from each other, uh, we're still working, we're still understanding our, our, our game uh, module and principles and, um, and and staying sharp. And so now it's just a physical aspect of things, of getting our bodies ready to go again when, when the season starts. Anything specific that you're looking forward to heading into the season? I'm just going to wish that again. I think it's a group that's really determined, a really uh, good group that has a chance of um, doing really well this season. And so I'm excited to see um, the group together again and working towards our goal of winning the championship. 
SAFC will resume the season Friday the 17th at RGV FC. Now, as for SAFC's home opener Saturday, July 25th, the club will play that match without fans in attendance. SAFC said after much internal discussion and dialogue with local officials, state officials, and public health experts, they made the decision. Their primary focus is the safety of both sides, fans, and game day staff. Interesting seeing the sporting teams in town, the different decisions they make. Yeah. You know, Flying Chancla's decided we'll do social distancing, mass, we'll try it out. SAFC says not right now. Not right now. All right. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. It's time for our KSAT Q&A, where we take your questions, our questions to some of the local experts. We are joined today by the president and CEO of Haven for Hope, a transitional center for the homeless in our community. Kenny Wilson joins us. Kenny, thank you for being with us. First of all, what is the situation at the Haven right now? Things are good at Haven. I'll tell you, it's been an ordeal like for everyone. Um, we all started on this uh, late February, early March, and we had to really sort of remake our campus and uh, protect those that reside there and our, those that work there. And uh, we've done that. Uh, we put an incredible amount of protection into place, all the things we're familiar with, masks and distancing and so forth, uh, but also just really doubled down on cleaning, including hiring professional cleaning help. Uh, the we think that worked well uh, because it was mid-June before we had a resident with a positive test. We feel pretty good that we went those three months, three and a half months without anyone ill. And uh, we're continuing to do that work on, on cleaning and mask and distancing and so forth. That's amazing when you consider most congregate settings that we've been talking about, whether it's the jail, or some nursing homes where they're, they become hot spots. That has to be your worst fear at the Haven. It is indeed. Uh, it has not happened. We have a few that have been positive. One of the, I mentioned we remade our campus. One of the things that we did was recognize that we had to have a place where we could isolate those who had tested positive or who had been tested who had symptoms and we converted our intake space uh, into uh, essentially a, a dormitory with 25 beds. Staff volunteer to work there 24-7. Uh, this is the riskiest group. We utilize that well, and then the city, who has been a great partner in all this, has a hotel where if someone gets tested, we take them there immediately for, for separation. Kenny, in connecting the homeless with services and helping them transition out of homelessness, face-to-face -face interaction has to be key. So how has your staff been able to do that in this time where we're all being told to social distance and to stay away from one another? Well, the social distancing was hard at first. We, we uh, just couldn't physically do it. We had too many people. We had about uh, 1,700 residents at the time. It's down now. <clears throat> but and to alleviate that distancing challenge, we implored the city and they readily agreed uh, to lease a hotel, a 313 room hotel. And, and when we did that, when we talked to the mayor and the city manager about it, uh, we were operating it within four days. We moved our most vulnerable persons uh, from Haven, those that are elderly, sick, underlying conditions that we know so much about. We think that has helped on the social distancing as well, and it alleviated the space need on our campus. You talk about how we've all faced challenges throughout this entire pandemic, but certainly some parts of our community more so than others. And that's actually the focus of the latest episode of mm -hmm. KSAT Explains, where we talk about the uneven impact that COVID-19 has had on our city. So what do you think are some of the unique challenges that our homeless population have had to face that perhaps the rest of the city may not have thought about? Well, it's an important question. I'll answer it in a very personal way. Um, uh, last week, I ended up ill, had symptoms of COVID, was tested, had to quarantine. Um, I tested negative, but it took four days to get that result. And 
while I uh, quarantined in my bedroom by myself uh, and had food brought to my door, I pondered those who uh, don't have that luxury, who don't have a bed, who don't have a bedroom, who don't have someone to help them. And such is the plight of those without a home. And so we know that there are many hundreds of people that um, do not have a home. And we are concerned also, of course, about those who might become homeless out of all the uh, job losses and evictions that we feel like are coming. Talk about uh, how the average person can help. How can, I mean, volunteering and f uh, clothing donations used to be so huge yeah. for the Haven. You, you're not taking volunteers right now. You're not taking used clothing. How can people help? Well, n know this, we are still doing business as usual. In the last quarter, three months or so, we've housed um, about 170 people that have gone from Haven to their own place to live gotten jobs for uh, 65 or 70, even during this time period. So our work is going on. Now, what's different about it is the fact that we don't have any volunteers. We stopped uh, in March. We stopped volunteers coming for their protection. Before March, we had about a thousand volunteers a month. That was, that has a imputed cost to it. I mean, that was a terrific cost savings. So how can you help? I think, uh, uh, number one, be very careful. We, we are uh, very careful not to very closely engage with anyone uh, on the street. Uh, we need help. Uh, we have, uh, we're blessed with great partners like the city and the county. Uh, and people have been very generous with their donations. We need more. Just that volunteer piece is an example I mentioned we doubled and tripled down on uh, commercial cleaning. That has a cost. So all this has been costly, uh, way beyond what we had budgeted for for this year. So we, we can use financial gifts. We can use uh, things like packages of new underwear, uh, new pants. Someone told me today, uh, anything that is uh, that can be utilized by our residents that is new or very slightly used. All right, so there are ways that we can still help. Everyone's adjusting to the, the parameters of this pandemic, but there are ways we can still make a difference. Indeed. Kenny Wilson, President and CEO of Haven for Hope, thanks so much for being with us. Kenny, we'll, see you. You, we'll see you tonight at 10, and I want to talk to you. Uh -huh. I know that you have a huge outreach within the homeless community, and one of the questions yeah, I want to ask you tonight at 10 is what yes. they're seeing out on the street. So we'll save that for the night beat. Thank Kenny you. Wilson, thank you. We'll be right back. Thanks, Every day, we're all learning what we think are new facts about COVID-19, only to later learn they've been disproven. The research underway to get to the bottom of this virus has been fast and furious, but it is constantly changing. One finding early on is that if you take certain painkillers, you actually make COVID-19 symptoms worse. Ursula Perry has the latest on that theory. We take about 30 billion doses of ibuprofen or similar drugs every year in the U.S. But early on in the pandemic, we were told that was a very bad idea. In mid-March, researchers reviewed three studies that included nearly 1,300 patients with severe COVID-19. Then they published a letter in The Lancet which suggested that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen may worsen the body's response to the coronavirus, leading health experts to start recommending other options. If you do have a fever, Tylenol would be a safer drug at this point in time. But then in late March, the World Health Organization modified its stance, saying there's currently no proven scientific link between ibuprofen and more serious illness. Obviously, more studies are needed. One theory why ibuprofen could worsen outcomes is that high doses can damage the kidneys. Too much ibuprofen can also cause rare but serious side effects, such as stomach bleeding, increased blood pressure, and heart attack or stroke. One way to avoid those side effects is not to take above the recommended amount. A recent study showed that 15% of us take too much ibuprofen. As far as that COVID-19 link, doctors are still using it with caution. They're waiting for more conclusive research to be finished. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Live cam outside, we have gone above and beyond. 
tough. Which isn't a good thing when it comes to high yeah, temperatures. We don't want to overachieve here. No, I think we will be, though, especially over the next few days. And that includes today as well. We've been reading 102 there at the bottom of your screen through the newscast, but we did make it up to 103 at the airport this afternoon. That's a new record for today's date, and we're going to continue to see records fall over the next few days in terms of heat. And today, uh, that was our fourth 100 degree day of the year. This number is going to steadily go up over the next few days as well. We'll take a look at your weekend forecast and get a check of the tropics coming up next. All right, we are barreling towards a hot weekend. I think we're there. Some of these <laughs> temperatures, I've, I've seen the seven day. Yeah, it's not, Ooh. not a pretty sight. I actually upped our temperature for tomorrow based on what we did today. I think we'll actually see some drier air work in during the afternoons beginning tomorrow and continuing through the weekend, and that should actually help our air temperatures to shoot up that much more. So a new record high temperature for today in San Antonio. That was also the case in Del Rio. Del Rio, your high today, 108. Also a new record for you, and those records will continue to fall this weekend. So forecasting 104 tomorrow, that would tie the record high, 105 on Sunday, and that would beat the old record of 103. Really what you need to know about the weekend ahead, it is going to be unseasonably hot out there. You've got to keep in mind our average high this time of year is in the mid-90s. We'll be some 10-plus degrees above that over the next several days. So it is a bit hot for this time of year. In advance of the heat this weekend, the National Weather Service has issued a heat advisory that will go into effect at 11 a.m. tomorrow and be in place all through the day Saturday and then all through the day Sunday until 8 p.m. These heat advisories are issued when the heat index readings or the heat indices get into a territory that can be quite dangerous if you're not taking care of your body, if you're spending a lot of time outside, not staying properly hydrated. Our heat index readings this weekend, things could become dangerous that can lead to heat illness and stuff like that. We do not want that, that's for sure. Heat advisories extend all the way through a good portion of Texas with the exception of the far northern and southern portions of the state, even into portions of Oklahoma and essentially all of Louisiana, seeing heat advisories in place this weekend. So it's not just us, a lot of heat building across the south. We'll shift gears here kind of quickly. I do want to update you on what's going on in the tropics. We had tropical storm Fay form yesterday. This is affecting New England this evening, moving north at 14 miles per hour, maximum sustained winds at 45 miles per hour. A lot of rain for the northeastern United States tonight. Fay will continue to move north tomorrow and then to uh, the rest of the weekend and then we'll gradually continue to weekend. But a lot of rain there through portions of New Jersey, uh, back through eastern Pennsylvania, New York, and uh, there through Massachusetts as well. Wish we could get in on at least a little bit of that elsewhere across the country. Uh, things are fairly quiet as you move off to the west. We do have a few little areas of severe weather up in the northern portion of the plains, but for the most part, we've got two Two kind of weather makers dominating weather across the country. The heat high, which of course is keeping us unseasonably hot this weekend. Also a little dip in the jet stream off to the east coast. That's helping to produce some more rain uh, across portions of the eastern United States. And then of course you've got Fay. But the heat high, that is what's going to continue to steer our forecast into the weekend. And um, look at these big time numbers. We'll have to wait for some of these high temperature numbers to come in today. But 103 for us, 109 the high temperature in El Paso. We'll take another kind of comprehensive look at your national high temperature later tonight on the night beat as the heat high hangs around. Of course, it will be staying hot 104 tomorrow 105 Sunday 106 on Monday. That should be the worst of it, if you will. But I mentioned we're going to see some drier air working in the afternoons. Our dew point numbers dropping into the 50s over the next few days. And while that will take a little edge off the heat index, still going to be 105 or 106 this weekend, so very hot. As we get into Monday, I mentioned this last half hour, CPS Energy is anticipating more very hot weather. Everyone getting back to work, that could cause a bit of a strain on the power grid on Monday, so you're encouraged there to limit your power uses, especially between about 3 and 7. That'll be coming up on Monday. We'll have more updates on that for you coming up this weekend. As for your Saturday, Mid 80s by 10 o'clock in the morning, 104 your high temperature tomorrow afternoon and the heat hangs around here. It uh, looks like the heat height will start to back off a bit this time next week, but still plenty of heat to go around guys. Yikes. In case you missed it coming <laughs> up next. <laughs>
It hasn't happened since World War II. First at five, San Antonio's annual party with a purpose has been canceled due to the coronavirus pandemic. A year like no other. The Fiesta Commission making that announcement this afternoon, laying out the next plan dates. Fiesta San Antonio Commission President Baltazar Walter Cerna Jr. released a statement which in part reads, quote, the health and safety of Fiesta guests and volunteers is the only priority in this decision. But we do know that the new schedule Schedule dates for Fiesta are April 15th through April 25th, 2021. If all goes as planned, it will be the 130th anniversary of Fiesta. A heated argument between a husband and wife ended with firefighters being called to their south side home. Officials say the couple arguing and at some point the man left the house, but not before setting fire to the outside of it. The woman had to be pulled out of the home through a window. She suffered minor injuries. She's expected to be OK. As for the husband at last check, he hadn't been caught yet. Dive teams in Canyon Lake have recovered the body of 25 year old Luis Rodriguez. Authorities had been searching for the man since Independence Day. Witnesses say he jumped off a boat to cool off and was in the water for just minutes before he went under. His body was found yesterday afternoon in an area of Party Cove. Chamoy City Limits is offering every Friday for the rest of the month. Chamoy City Limits, with the help of Centro San Antonio, will set up at several downtown locations from 2 until six to hand out free face masks, hand sanitizers, and paletas. Chamoy City Limits plans to continue spreading their message by handing out sweet treats every Friday in July. That's all our time. Thanks for watching the News at 6. See you right back here on the Night Beat at 10.